Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we are going to be talking more about network switches. So network switches are the networking devices that you use to connect all of your other hardware wired networking devices together. And there is a lot more to network switches than many people realize. Uh, so most people, if they're used to dealing with network switches in a, in a home environment or possibly a small business environment, they're probably used to a relatively small switch that's relatively inexpensive and basically all they do is they plug a cat 5 cable or cat 6 cable into it maybe they reboot it every once in a while and that's about all they think about as far as switches are concerned but the reality is is once you start getting into larger networks or more specialized networks switches have become a very very valuable tool and you really need to understand what options are available for switches and basically you need to understand Understand what you're going to be looking for when you go out into the world to buy a switch. Uh, one of the things I've talked about a lot in these technology classes is it's important to understand as a technology professional, there's a difference between the science and the art of being a technology professional. The science of being a technology professional is understanding things like routing protocols and networking protocols, understanding MAC addresses, understanding the OSI model, all of that type of thing. But the art of being a technology professional is to be able to take all of these different concepts, all of these different products, and actually build out uh, the type of infrastructure that your company or your organization needs. One of the important things to understand when you're thinking about going out and purchase network switches is that engineering uh, is basically the same way. Again, there's the science of how MAC address tables work and all that kind of stuff, but then there's the art of the actual product that they are going to put together and then that they're going to sell en masse. One of the big issues that you can run into as a technology professional is when you go out to spend a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollars on networking equipment, you might overlook a couple of features or pieces of functionality. You might not realize how important those are, and all of a sudden your project fails because that hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment that you bought literally simply doesn't do what you need it to do. So it's really important to understand when you're gonna go out and you're going to buy a network switch that you really understand what the capabilities of network switches are to verify they can do what you need them to do. And it's also important to go into your own infrastructure, take a look at the network switches that you already have, and really do an assessment to try to understand whether the network switches are really useful for you in the modern world. One of the big problems with network switches is, frankly, if you buy like a Cisco net network switch or a Netgear uh, network switch, something like that, that's pretty high quality. The reality the reality is, is network switches will last forever forever, 10, 15, 20, possibly 30 years. Uh, the problem is, is right, they were built with a technology that existed at the time. So one of the issues that you may have with your network, you may get weird problems, you may get weird slowdowns and bottlenecks and you can't figure out what's going on. One of the problems might be is literally you have a 15 year old network switch in your environment and uh, when, all the, when traffic goes through that particular switch, it runs into issues because it was built 15 years ago and literally all you have to do is swap out that one switch and, uh, and your entire environment might be able to function a lot better. So in today's class, we're going to be talking more about what these network switches are, the different functionality that is available in these network switches, and some of the things that you need to think about when you're going out to purchase a network switch or again to assess the network switches that are already in your environment. So one of the first things to remember when you're dealing with a network switch is that this is a layer two device on the OSI model, right? There's a seven layers of the OSI model. Layer one is the physical layer. Layer two is the data link layer. Layer three is the networking layer. Layer four is the transport layer, so on and so forth. So basically when you're dealing with a switch, you are dealing with a networking device at the layer two level. So this is at the Ethernet level. This is before TCP IP addresses uh, whenever you're doing networking, right? So basically with network switches, they understand MAC addresses. They're called media access control addresses. These are more or less hard coded into every single uh, networking device that you're going to deal with. So every single port on your computer or server is going to have its own uh, MAC address and that is what the switch is going to understand. But, but 
kind of like with the MAC addresses, you know, where I say MAC addresses are hard coded, except for the points when they're kind of sort of not and they can be modified. The same is true with switches. And when we're talking about switchers, switches being a layer two device, you know, most of the time they're a layer two device, except for when the company that's building the, uh, the switch decides to also make it a layer three device. And so you can get some functionality at the T TCP IP version four address level. And so that's one of the important things to, to be thinking about, right? Uh, so uh, later in the class, we're gonna go through and look at all the specifications for a, a switch, Cisco switch uh, that I pulled up so we can take a look at some of the, uh, the, the features and functionality of a high quality switch uh, and one of the things with that is that there's actually a lot of functionality with TCP IP the important thing to understand here is that this is an additional add-on to the switch so since you already have a switch and you want to figure out how to make that switch worth more money basically they dump a whole bunch of uh, TCP IP rules and that kind of stuff on top of the switch but in general a switch is only a at that layer two level again that media access control level so that's just one of those things to, to be thinking about when you go out there and look at switches and all that kind of thing uh, again that can be a, one of the problems with trying to teach people especially with through video classes online is I say something like lay a switch is a layer two device and then you go out and start doing research and you find all, out all this layer three stuff about a specific switch you're looking at. And then you think I'm a moron. And it's like, no, 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 a, a switch is the concept, the con, the Plato's cave. Have you heard of Plato's cave? Like the, the quintessential things in the world, right? The quintessential switch only deals with Mac addresses. But the actual physical devices sometimes we get in the real world, uh, again, they have extra you know, functionality and add-ons uh, that are added on top of it. And so that's something to consider. Why the, the, uh, the TCP IP uh, add-ons, the additional functionality can be added to a switch uh, is basically for things such as security measures, right? So with media access control addresses, these are hard-coded more or less at the manufacturer. Those go out in the world. And so there's not a lot of customization there's not a lot of, of things that you specifically can do uh, in order to create like MAC address schemes something like that uh, with TCP IP addresses though right you can create subnet masks you can create specific networks and IP address schemes and all that kind of stuff and when you do that you can do that for specific purposes for security and that type of thing so one of the one of the things is if you have a switch that understands your TCP IP address schemes then if a nefarious device is on the network and it's trying to communicate with the, all of your servers or all of your surveillance cameras or something like that, then the switch might be able to actually detect that and try to shut the, down that kind of communication. So that's one of the reasons why a switch might understand TCP IP version four. And so this is just kind of one of those things just to keep in mind when you're looking at switch specifications. Now, one of the first things to consider when you're going to go out and you're going to purchase a switch for your environment is whether you're going to get a managed switch or an unmanaged switch. It's important to understand here with this decision, this decision is not about how quote unquote real your organization is or how quote unquote real your infrastructure is. It is simply, do you need to go in and do configurations on your switch or do you simply need to connect different devices to your switch and just allow them to communicate? So when we talk about a managed switch, this means you can actually go into the switch and you can modify configurations within the switch. Uh, so we'll talk about this in a little bit, things such as a quality of service basically can you do packet prioritization so that voice over IP traffic has a higher priority than FTP traffic can you go in there and manually configure that can you turn on or turn off specific ports again if you're thinking about an environment where you're worried about security one of the ways to make sure that a nefarious hacker isn't able to gain access to your network using an unused port on your switch is if you literally 
turn off the switches, the ports on your switch that you're not currently using. Do you need to do that type of thing? Do you need to go in and do other kinds of like configurations for routing protocols or configurations for whether a specific port should be 100 megabits per second or a gigabit per second or 10 megabits per second, whether it should be half duplex or whether it should be full duplex? Uh, do you need to go in and you need to configure VLANs? Again, we'll talk about VLANs in a little bit. Basically, with a managed switch, you're able to go in and you're able to do a hell of a lot of configurations that could could be valuable for your environment, but it's also going to cost you some extra money, right? An unmanaged switch, so this, what I have in my hand, is actually an unmanaged switch. Basically, this is a switch it just does what it does what it does. Uh, the ports are uh, are configured for what's called auto negotiation. Basically, they communicate with the device that's connected to them. They figure out the speed. They figure out the duplex. They figure out a few other things. And basically, it all everything is done automatically. And you, as an administrator, can't do anything with this, right? Basically, you plug it in the wall. You plug the network cables into it and it does what it does. This can be very useful for you in environments where you're doing things such as surveillance cameras, right? So if I'm going to go into an environment, I'm going to install 20 surveillance cameras. So I'm installing the surveillance cameras. I know the specifications of surveillance cameras and I know they're, they're new, they're modern surveillance cameras. They don't have any weird things. I know the switch that I'm purchasing uh, has more than enough resources to be able to deal with these surveillance cameras. I know I'm not gonna plug anything else other than surveillance cameras into this particular network, I may want an unmanaged switch just so I can literally plug it in and walk away. So this is one of those things that you're going to have to consider whenever you're building out your network. Um, and an important thing to, to be thinking about too is what are the resources um, that your team has for being able to manage switches. A lot of times, one of the problems we run into is team leads or business owners, they want to seem cool. They want to seem quote unquote real. So they'll go out and they'll buy fancy, expensive Cisco switches so that they can prove to the world that they have a real company. Uh, one of the issues you can run into is if your IT staff doesn't know how to manage the networking equipment you just installed, uh, then you could have a lot more problems going on in the future. So sometimes, right, you know, if you have a small IT department, you have a small company, it might actually be better to have an unmanaged switch where you don't even have to worry about anybody trying to do uh, administration uh, on the switch uh, because you know that you don't have the technical resources in your company anyway. So that's one of the things to be thinking about with, uh, with switches, whether they should be managed or unmanaged. Basically, when you go, you can buy them and they'll tell you this is an unmanaged, sw unmanaged switch with X, Y, or Z, or this is a managed switch with X, Y, or Z. When you go and you do look to buy a switch that is managed, one of the things that you do have to be looking at is how you manage the switch, right? So a lot of people, if you're used to thinking about the you know Cisco and the CCNA, uh, basically with Cisco switches, again, a lot of the old routing equipment especially, you would actually manage these at the command line. There was, there was a console jack that you would use. You would connect your computer to the console jack, uh, and basically you would pull up you would pull up essentially a command line and you would literally have to type commands into the switch uh, much the way that you would type in commands to uh, to PowerShell or to the command line uh, on a Linux system. And the thing with that is it can be very powerful because you can get very nuanced and get very specific with what you're doing. It's very good for security because they have multiple uh, layers or security layers for, for what different user accounts can access different things within the switch. Uh, there are a lot of valuable things with uh, being able to configure a switch from the command line. The problem is, is if you or if your staff don't know the command line for that particular switch, yeah, it can be a bit of a pain in the butt, right? If your switch starts having problems and you need to troubleshoot it, but nobody understands the com command line interface for the switch, it becomes a problem. And so that's where a lot of switches now, uh, again, if you purchase a Netgear, if you purchase Ubiquity, you purchase from another uh, many other vendors, you can actually get a graphical user interface. They have a web interface that you can interact with. So essentially, there's a management port on the switch. You're able to plug that into the network. It has its own IP address. You pull that IP address up in a browser, and then you can see. You can see the status of all the different ports. You can see the configurations 
options for all the different ports. You can see all your VLAN configurations, your quality service, all of those types of things. So that's something that you need to be considering when you go to purchase a switch, if you're gonna be buying a managed switch, is what is the interface going to be that you're going to be using in order to actually manage the switch. Nowadays, there are different providers that actually have cloud services. Uh, so, uh, so Cisco actually has that, it's called Meraki. Uh, but basically, if you have a lot of networking equipment in different sites uh, all around the country or all around the world, you can actually go to one single uh, cloud interface. In that interface, you can see all of your different networking equipment, and then you can manage all of your networking equipment from that one place. And <laughs> There's good points to that, and to be clear, there's bad points to that. I'm just saying that that exists. Uh, some some of the different uh, networking equipment out there uh, actually have iOS or Android apps, so you're you're able to manage your networking equipment through that app instead of having to use a command line or anything else. One of the things to be considering here, though, is to be thinking about what do you think the, the life expectancy or how long do you think the refresh cycle will be on your networking equipment? So if you purchase networking equipment and it has some kind of iOS app that works that works really well so you can figure the networking equipment, but then they stop uh, updating that app in a few years, one of the problems you can run into is that your switch, that should last you probably at least a decade, you might have to swap out in five or six years because they're no longer updating the iOS app that you need to be able to manage the switch so these are some things to be considering a lot of people out there when they think about an unmanaged switch or managed switch they're just like i'm gonna do a managed switch i'm gonna buy cisco because cisco is the best and then they're sitting there with there with that, that little baby blue cable you get with cisco equipment <laughs> and they're looking at their computer and they're looking at the switch they're like, I don't, I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do next. And this can be, this can be a real issue. Uh, again, if you're going to be a manager or a business owner. So with the switches, you've got the unmanaged and the managed. What you decide to do is really dependent upon your situation. Okay, so the first thing that you need to take a look at when you're going out to purchase a switch or when you're going to assess the switches that are already in your environment is to take a look at the networking ports, right? So these are the ports that are on the front of the switch and these are the ports that you're going to use to connect all of your hardwired uh, network devices. Uh, so these will be the uh, the desktop computers in your environment. These will be the, the printers that are hardwired uh, to your network. These will be be for the routers these will be for you know whatever hardwired networking devices that you have when you go and you take a look at the the ports on the particular switch that you have uh, you'll notice there can be a number of different uh, port numbers right so you can have a four port switch so this is a little switch that I have in my hands uh, basically this is for creating like a little digital surveillance system something like that uh, so you can have a four port switch you can have a eight port switch you can have a 16 port switch Switch, you can have a 24 port switch, you can have a 48 port switch, and you can have many, 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 many more ports. Uh, one of the things to be thinking about if you're going to go out and you're going to purchase a switch for your environment is always buy a switch with more ports than you actually need, right? You can't you can't just add a couple of extra ports to a switch if you need them. You have to go out and buy an entirely new switch. So let's say you're going into your environment, you need you know you need 24 ports uh, for your particular environment. Environment, I would argue just buy 48 ports now. Uh, it'll be less expensive than buying an entirely new 24 port. 24 port switch in the future and so basically one of my one of my arguments is to always over produce over provision for switch ports when you're going out to actually purchase switch ports but basically you go out there and you take a look at CD, cdw or new egg or whatever uh, and you see all of the different switches that are available and you pick the the, the switch that, that has the number of ports that you need now with these ports uh, these ports can come in a number of different speeds generally nowadays there'll be gigabit uh, ports so it's it's 10 100 by gigabit per second uh, ports uh, back originally with Ethernet back in the the uh, the, the 70s or, or the 80s you would actually have a 10 megabit per second uh, connection on a switch then in the 90s we got to 10 100 megabit per second and you know about 10 years ago we got up to gigabit uh, per second connections on the switch so this is the fastest the switch is able to reach relay data 
over that one particular pork. Uh, and so that's something to be thinking about. Again, with your environment, you may have purchased uh, a bunch of new uh, desktop computers, right? Gone out, buy some, bought some really high quality desktop computers with gigabit ports uh, on those, uh, those computers. You plug them into the network and they're still acting relatively slow. One of the reasons might be is the switch that you have uh, in your network is actually an old 10100 switch. So no matter how fast the network card is on your computer, it is always going to be limited to 100 megabits per second. That's just one of those things to keep in mind, again, when you're looking at switches and trying to figure out what's going on with your network. The other thing to be thinking about with the communication on these ports is there is half duplex or full duplex communication. Again, in the 2020s, everything you're dealing with should be full duplex. Basically what full duplex is, is it's like a telephone call. Both sides, both computers or devices can communicate at the same time. Data be, can, can be sent and data can be received at the same time. Old networking equipment though, sometimes used to be half duplex, as in it was only able to send or receive data at any one time. Now, in the modern world, you probably shouldn't have to worry about this, but Right again, the ba the bane of technology professionals is legacy equipment. Legacy equipment, right? There's some little box in your infrastructure that was purchased in 1995, and for some reason, it's still there. That box, whatever it may be, it may be an old, maybe an old like network printer. Like so, so some companies even to this day use archaic dot matrix printers. So dot matrix printers. Um, Basically, they used a, uh, they had a, they had a, oh, what did they have? They, they had this like ink roll thing and then they had pens. And so they'd hammer, they'd hammer the pins through the ink roll, and that's what would, would give you the image on the other side. Uh, that can be used if you need like triplicate, uh, triplicate forms. So sometimes like with uh, auto dealerships or like old manufacturing companies, whenever they print something out, they need it printed in triplicate. So they might be using one of these really old dot matrix printers that for some reason, again, may, may only do like half duplex communication. That, that's one of the kinds of things that, that might be in, in the real world. And so one of the issues that you can run into is if your networking port is set to full duplex and the device that's trying to communicate with it is only communicating in half duplex, you can get a, a, some weird uh, communication errors there. Uh, so that is something to consider. And again, that would be the type of environment where you would want a managed switch versus an unmanaged switch. What is supposed to happen with these networking ports is there's something called auto negotiation, right? So what auto negotiation is, is the port is supposed to communicate with the device that's connected to it and basically say, hey, what are you? And the device says, hey, I'm a hundred megabit per second full duplex. And then the, uh, the, the port switch is supposed to auto configure to what that is. Um, you know, computers, <laughs> computers. <laughs> Oh, if they did what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't have jobs. Um, so sometimes the auto negotiation fails. And so many times you may actually have to go into your switch and hard code the configuration uh, so that it's set specifically to whatever device is uh, it, it's communicating with. Uh, this can also be a valuable thing going in there and hard coding uh, the ports if you're using a switch in kind of like a data center environment. So let's say you have a server rack and in that server rack, you have a NAS, a network attached storage device, you have your Active Directory server, you have your web server, that type of thing. Well, you know all the hardware specifications for those different servers. So you might wanna go in and actually hard code hard configure uh, the port configuration to what those different servers need to make sure there's no quirks with the auto negotiation, right? If somebody uh, basically reboots the switch at some point in time, for some reason the auto negotiation doesn't work properly, so something gets set in the incorrect way, and let's say it's for your NAS. So with a NAS, one of the interesting things is you can use it for virtualization. So essentially you have your NAS um, and then your servers that are virtualized instances of operating systems are communicating with the NAS? Well, if something happens and the auto negotiation on the switch port 
doesn't get configured properly, now all of a sudden, all of those virtual machines, all those servers that are communicating with the NAS, right? if that gets dropped down to half duplex or 100 megabits per second or something because the switch screws something up, that can cause a lot of issues. So simply going to the port and saying, okay, I want to make sure this is a gigabit per second. I want to make sure that it's full duplex. And so even if the switch gets rebooted, uh, that configuration won't change, won't go anywhere. So that's one of the things to be thinking about with the, uh, the, the switch ports. Also with the switch ports, one of the things we've talked about before is something called PoE. It's called Power Over Ethernet. So in the modern world, when you're dealing with uh, networked devices, one of the things that's really cool is you can actually get the power for the network device directly from from the switch itself. So if you have a surveillance camera, if you have a voice over IP uh, telephone, uh, even some uh, laptop computers at this point in time can actually be powered directly from the switch. So one of the things that you'll see is when you look at the specifications for a switch, it will tell you whether the ports have PoE, power over ethernet, and then it will tell you what level of power over ethernet those those switches actually have. So those are those are the network switches, uh, the network ports on a switch, and this is some of the stuff to be thinking about when you go to purchase the, your network switch or assess the switch that's in your environment. The next thing to take a look at with switches are the uplink ports, right? So if we take a look at this particular switch right here, we have the networking ports on one side, and then over here on the right-hand side, we have the uplink ports. What these uplink ports are used for is these ports are used for this switch to be able to connect to other switches so that you can make your local area network larger, right? So this may be a useful thing if you have a building. So let's say you have a building and you want to to put one switch on each floor. Basically what you can do is you can put one switch on the bottom floor, have that connected to your router, that type of thing. And then with the uplink port, you can then connect the bottom floor switch to the first floor switch with the uplink port and the first floor switch with the second floor switch and the second floor switch with the third floor switch, so on and so forth. So that way you can have this unified uh, switch infrastructure, but you, then you can make sure that the ports are basically put in the different networking closets on the different floors. So this can be a useful thing. Again, do realize uh, when you actually have to run network cable, CAT6 network cable at this point in time, it costs a lot lot of money to run cat6 networking cable so the the shorter uh, the distance you have to run that cat6 networking cable the less money it's going to be also do realize i think what's it's the the cat6 cable can only be 100 meters in length uh, so that would be about 300 feet and so essentially what you want to do is if you're going to wire up an entire floor of a building or possibly a building that's in part in part of a larger network, you can have all the CAT6 run to one uh, network closet, and then inside the network closet, all of those wires will run to a switch. That switch will then have a, an uplink connection that will then be able to be connected to other switches within the infrastructure. And so that's what the uplink ports do. Now, when you're taking a look at the uplink ports, there's a couple of things to consider. The first is the speed of the uplink ports. Uh, so if you buy lower quality uh, switches, at this point in time with uh, with uplink ports a lot of times they'll be gigabit per second uh, uh, ports one of the important things to realize there is that is the total speed that will be able to go from one switch to another. Uh, so if all you're doing is uh, print jobs, if all you're doing is email, FTP, maybe some voice over IP traffic, having a gigabit per second connection on your uplink ports might not be a big a deal. But if you're transferring large files, so let's say you are, you are creating infrastructure for a company that does video editing. Imagine if you have 10 video editors on one floor and then on another floor you have your storage area network what's called a SAN so basically imagine your storage is on a different uh, different floor if you only have a one gigabit per second uplink between those two floors that is going to create a bottleneck for you so with these uplink ports you can get them in one gigabit per second you can get them in 10 gigabits per second I think you can get them up to a hundred gigabits per second and so that's 
that's one of the things that you're going to have to consider when you look at your environment and your particular situation. The other thing that you're going to have to look at is the actual media that is used uh, to connect these uh, these switches, right? So normally, uh, when we're thinking about networking in the Ethernet world, we're thinking about Cat6 cable in the modern world. It can go up to 10 gigabits per second. So that's that twisted pair cable that I've shown you before. Basically, we had Cat3 cable, Cat5 cable, Cat5e, and now we have Cat6 cable. So uh, they use an RJ45 jack uh, and can plug in to the normal ports on your switch. Now for the uplink ports, sometimes they will be RJ45 uh, ports and you can connect them with Cat6 or, or Cat5 or something like that. Many times though, they will actually be uh, what are called SFP ports. So the FF, SFP ports allow you to use fiber optic runs. So basically you can use fiber optic cable to connect the switches. Uh, and that can be very useful because fiber optic can have a lot longer run than that 100 meters we're limited to with the, the Cat6 cable. The only issue you might run into is if you're expecting, you know, if you're expecting to be able to use Cat6 cable and basically you purchase one of these switches and they have SFP ports, so you need the fiber optic cable, that's one of those things that can just be an issue for you. So it's just, it's one of those, uh, something that you do need to keep in mind when you're going to be purchasing a switch. So that's basically all the, the uplink ports allow you to do. They uh, allow you to connect multiple switches together. Um, and basically with that, you then get the speed. Uh, and also you could use fiber optic if you like. Uh, again, if you need to have longer runs between the switches to be able to have everything communicate with each, with each other. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about are VLANs or virtual LANs. And now, when we're talking about virtual LANs, this has nothing to do with the virtualization you're probably thinking about. This isn't about virtual servers. This isn't about cloud infrastructure. We talk about virtual LANs. This is a concept from decades ago, long before AWS was even thought about. Basically, one of the ideas with virtual LANs is, basically, is the question, what happens when you have different networks that you want to create, but they're going to be physically close to each other, right? So let's say you want to create a surveillance camera network. Let's say you want to create a voice over IP network. And let's say you want to create a computer network, but you want them separated from each other, right? If a hacker is able to get into the computer network, you don't want them to be able to compromise the voice over IP uh, or the surveillance system network. Uh, if one of your administrators does something stupid and basically puts you know a 20 a 20 megapixel surveillance camera uh, onto your network and is just dumping a tremendous amount of data in your network and causing a bottleneck you don't want that bottleneck to affect the voice over IP or the uh, or the the computer network right so basically you want these siloed networks but Right, the surveillance camera is gonna be in the office environment. The voice over IP phone is going to be right beside the desktop computer. So you want them to be physically close together. And so you look at the switch that you're going to purchase and you think, I don't really wanna buy three switches. So that's one of the things you could do, right? You could buy a switch for the surveillance cameras, you could buy a switch for the telephones and you could buy a switch for your computers uh, and then basically have them be their own entire physical infrastructure. You think about that. That's going to cost a lot of money that's a lot of additional overhead that type of thing so basically the idea with a virtual LAN is what if you take this one physical switch that you have and essentially you're able to divide it up into different networks right so basically we are going to have VLAN 1 virtual LAN 1 and that is going to be for the surveillance cameras we will have VLAN 2 uh, virtual LAN 2 and that will be for the telephones we'll have VLAN 3 virtual LAN 3 and that will be for the computers. It's important to understand with these VLANs is when you create a virtual LAN on the switch, it is entirely segregated from the other VLANs on the switch and you actually need a router in between ports on the different VLANs for the, uh, the different VLANs to be able to communicate with each other. So it's entirely separated. Again, if a hacker, a bad hacker is able to get into VLAN 3, uh, 
they are not going to be able to very easily get into VLAN 2 or into VLAN 1 in order to, to try to do something nefarious with the, the surveillance cameras or the, uh, the voice over IP telephones. And so basically that's all a VLAN is. It, is, it allows you to, to chunk up, basically you have the one physical switch, it allows you to divide up the ports on that physical switch so that some ports are for one VLAN and different ports are for a different VLAN and that they are not able to communicate with each other. In modern networking, you can actually tag um uh, different computers or different devices uh, that are connected to the network and actually tag them as VLAN 1 or VLAN 2 or VLAN 3. That's something to get into with a much more in-depth uh, switch class uh, but basically with the vlan thing the main thing for you to be thinking about is this is how we can take one physical switch and turn it into three logical switches so the next thing to talk about is loop detection and routing protocols <laughs> I made a lot of money back in the day before loop detection became a standard thing. And again, if you have legacy equipment or inexpensive networking equipment, you might not have loop detection built into your switch. So basically all loop detection is, all loop detection is, is if somebody takes one end of a cat five or cat six cable, plugs it into one port on the switch, and then takes it and plugs it into a different port on the switch, basically loop detection is able to detect this loop and then automatically turn it off, right? Uh, and that is a very, very useful thing. The problem that you run into in the real networking world is remember with switches and, and networking devices, they're constantly, if, if they can't find um, a, a device, an IP address or a MAC address on their network, uh, they'll send it out to another network and they'll send it out to another network and they'll send it out to another network, right? So one of the issues that you can have, right? If you have a switch, and you wind up having a loop on that switch is that all of a sudden the traffic goes out of one port, comes back into another port, then goes back out, then goes back in and back out and back in and back out and back in and back out, right? And it ends up crashing your switch. Or if you have multiple switches together and somehow a loop gets created somewhere in this mess, what can happen is essentially you can have the packets, they start to go into a loop, and then your entire network comes to a standstill. This is something that can happen in the real world. Uh, one of the ways it can happen in a normal like server room is let's say you have a lot of long patch cables, right? So you have a you have a switch up at the top of your your, your server rack, and then I don't know, you got you know somebody somebody bought like a 15 foot you know patch cable, and so the cable comes out of one side, and then it's supposed to go out down into your Active Directory directory server and your VoIP server or whatever else. Let's say uh, you had a server in your environment, uh, that server uh, was is no longer used, so it got pulled out of your environment. Somebody did not pull the cable out of the switch though, and so basically you have like this 15 foot cable, and then there's just, there's just, there's just the end. There's just, just this, uh, the, this little cable that's sitting there not plugged into anything. And so, so some intern walks into your environment and goes, oh, that should be plugged into the switch. And then they plug it into the switch, and then about eh, five minutes later, <laughs> your network crashes, right? Because that's the thing you like you 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 have it plugged into the switch, you know, up at the top of the uh, up at the top of the rack. It goes through that 15 foot cable. Somebody didn't realize, comes back up, gets plugged back into the switch, and now you have a loop going on. Um, and basically, that switch is just continuously sending the packet through the loop, uh, and then they crash. Uh, one of the things that I saw in the past, uh, something that I actually dealt with, is I had a client of mine using kind of really old networking equipment um, that wasn't very good. <laughs> And so they hired me to come in and replace their old networking equipment to try to speed up their network. So I was I was a good I was a good technician. I was a good technician. And so basically I would plug I would unplug all the specific networking cables, uh, plug it back, you know, plug it into the new equipment that I had purchased and, you know, about 5 minutes after <laughs> after I got everything plugged in, the entire network crashed. That was a that was a couple of hours of troubleshooting cuz I couldn't understand what was going on. Because it was like, well, well, wait a minute here, because everything was working before, 
uh, we have new net, known good. We have new networking equipment that, that we installed. I don't I don't understand why this is crashing. And the reason was is because they had uh, they had uh, different switches in different parts of the building, and basically the, a, a a loop had been created like years in the past before I had become a consultant for this company. But because the old networking equipment was so crappy and slow, the loop kind of slowed down the entire network. But it wasn't the, the equipment wasn't fast enough to to actually crash itself. And so when I plugged in the new networking equipment. Um, everything crashed because the new networking equipment was a hell of a lot faster and therefore instead of being a little bit slow it just crashed the network I had to go in figure out where the uh, where the where the loop was pull that out and everything worked like a champ and so basically a loop detection can be a very valuable thing uh, for your switches and that's one of the things like if you walk into an environment and the network is down the net like the network not the internet is down but the network is down and you're sitting there and you're looking at the switch and you're looking at everything you're like huh this seems like it should be fine uh, one of the troubleshooting routines you should do is simply unplug all the uh, all the, uh, the, the, the 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 patch cables going into the switch and replug them in and basically when uh when one of the patch cables when you plug it in and, and the entire network fails that's most likely where you have a loop somewhere uh, so loop detection can be a very useful thing if you're going to be buying switches in the 2020s make sure you do have loop detection uh, beyond that one of the things we've talked about before we'll talk about this more in a different class class is something called routing protocols right so we've talked about protocols in the past, networking protocols, TCP IP version four, TCP IP version six, uh, IPX, SPX, NetBuoy, if you know what the hell those mean. If you don't know what those mean, don't worry about it, they, they're old, right? But those are the networking protocols. And remember, a protocol is a language, right? So when I'm trying to send an email, I, I use SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. When I send a document, I, may, I might use FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Well, in the routing world, in the networking world, there are protocols too. Generally, when you're dealing with switches, there's something called OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. And basically, this is a protocol that switches and other networking equipment can use to communicate with each other. And so when two computers are trying to uh, talk to each other on the network, uh, a protocol such as Open Shortest Path First will try to find the shortest path in the network uh, to allow the two computers uh, to be able to communicate. One of the things to be thinking about when you're going to buy a switch, especially like in the enterprise environment, not, not necessarily in the small business environment or even the mid-sized uh, environment, but when you're dealing with, you know, a thousand users on a network, when you're dealing with multiple floors, when you're dealing with routers and different switches, one of the important things to look at is what uh, routing protocols your switch may use uh, that may be useful to optimize how traffic is, is basically sent throughout your network. Uh, so so that you, you don't get bottlenecks in certain areas. And so we'll talk about this more in a different class, but an important thing to be thinking about when you purchase a switch is what routing protocols uh, you it's uh, set up to be able to understand and whether or not you can use that in your environment. So now that we've talked about a lot of the features and functionalities of switches, I just wanna take a look at a spec sheet for a Cisco switch to give you, again, a good idea in the real world about the specifications when you're going to look to buy a switch. Uh, now I just went to, what are this, routerswitch.com, FTC compliance, I have no idea who these people are. They just have a nice spec sheet for the Cisco router I'm looking at. Uh, and I found this particular router, this is a 24 port uh, catalyst switch, so Catalyst is a series of Cisco switches. And as you can see, it's $3,208, again, for a 24-port switch. Just, just so everybody's clear, I'll put this in here. Um, I get a lot of crap in the YouTube world because I use Mac, right? A lot of people laugh at me and they go, <laughs> look at you wasting money on a Mac. And one of the things that I try to explain to the noobs <laughs> Is if you think three thousand dollars is a lot of money in the IT world, you are a noob, right? Uh, the reality is when you go out there and you start building infrastructure, infrastructure gets really, really, really expensive really quickly. And so this is something just to keep in mind. If you are a business owner, if you're building out your own infrastructure, it's important just to keep this in mind because 
it might cost a lot more than you're expecting, you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna buy a 24 port switch. You're used to going to Best Buy and you know you think it's gonna cost you $200 and then the consultant comes back to you with a $3,000 bill and you're like, ah, why is it $3,000? And it's like, well, well, yeah, that, that switch you were looking at at Best Buy, that's good for a home environment or if you're gonna have a LAN party for playing video games. You, you have, you know, 20 servers that are replicating data, you know, between them, plus they need to be able to communicate with, with some other systems or whatever else. You can't use a $200 Best Buy switch to get that done. You need something of a higher quality. So that's an important thing to be thinking about. The other thing to be thinking about too is again, uh, expectations management when you're dealing with the executives or when you're dealing with the management of your company. One of the things that, that I always say is, is I, I never want to have an argument with my customer or with my client or with my boss. I just always want to have a very slow conversation with them, right? Again, especially if you're an employee, it's one of those things day after day after day after day, you simply bring up things and you kind of, sh you shift the manager's viewpoint to change to what reality looks like more. Again, you may have a manager that thinks a switch could cost $200. And so, you know, one day you go in and you're like, okay, you know, we're thinking about buying one of these servers. There's an option for, you know, a $5,000 server or a $20,000 server. They go, why would we ever spend $20,000 on a server? And then you explain them all the bells and whistles, high availability and agentless uh, SNMP and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, well, okay, well, no, that's too much money. But now I understand why you'd spend $20,000 on a server, right? You sit there and you have these little discussions with, with the higher ups so that when you come to them and you need to spend $3,000 on a 24 port switch, um, they, they either don't have a heart attack or try to fire you on the spot. Um, so again, just one of those things to, to be thinking about. A, a lot of the folks that, that view my content, again, you know, they're, they're, they're young adults, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, that type of thing. When we talk about the price of equipment, um, a lot of times they're looking at what their bank account can handle, not necessarily what their company's bank account can handle. And so they this is just kind of something to consider. Again, a $3,000 switch, that actually isn't even that expensive. I just kind of want to point that out. But anyways, so this is a 24 port catalyst switch. If we go down here, we can take a look at the uh, the quick specifications for this particular switch. Uh, they tell you uh, what the, uh, the the model number of this thing is. Uh, they tell you uh, basically that it's rack mountable and that it's a 1U rack mountable switch. Uh, so whenever you're dealing with server racks, space in the server racks is measured by U. Uh, so you get have a one U device, a two U device, a three U device, a four U device, so on and so forth. Like uh, uh, many servers will be for you. If you're dealing with like NAS devices, network attached storage, they might be for you. Ser servers might be for you. Most networking equipment, routers and that type of thing will be one U and then you have everything in between. Uh, basically, this is just simply important for <laughs> How much space do you have on your rack? Again, that's one of the things that talk like the noobs sometimes don't understand is a lot of times you buy equipment like literally based off of what you have. We have one U left in the rack. Therefore, we need to find something that fits into one U, right? That's one of those things to consider. Again, when you have an entire server rack, you may have a 48U server rack. That seems a lot, right? 48U, that could theoretically be 48 1U servers. One of the important things to be considering though is when you're filling up that server rack, it's like, okay, well, we have we have this one NAS device and that takes four, uh, but then that gets replicated to another NAS device and that takes another four U. And then we have this voice over IP system that takes another four U. Like sometimes building out infrastructure is really, really, really basic math. You have so many you in your server rack is the equipment that you're putting in there going to be less than that number of you. Just one of those things to consider. Uh, then we have uh, uh, here, we have the uplink interfaces. Again, with this, you can either have two times uh, 10 gigabit per second 
SFP plus, or you can have four uh, times one gigabit per second SFP. So SFP, that's that fiber optic connection, again, which is which is a fine connection. There's no snark with SFP, but you, you just gotta have the, the wire to actually be able to do it. Uh, and then depending on which one you're purchasing, you can either, for the uplink, you can either get two 10 gig or four one gig. Again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, then we have the, the number of ports. Again, take a look at this. We have 24 times 10 by 100 by by a gig so that tells me I have 24 a uh, one gigabit ports on this particular switch this is very important to look at when you're going out there and buying switches again when you look at power over Ethernet or different types of speed for switches sometimes you'll have a 24 port switch and it'll say something like eight PoE ports and then maybe, you know, like four, you know, back in the day, like one gigabit per second ports, and then everything else would be a different speed. So it is important when you take a look at these ports, make sure if you have a 24 port switch, you're buying a 24 port switch, that all 24 ports match whatever your requirements are, or at least the number of ports, you know, the, the PoE ports or whatever else match uh, what your requirements are. Then we have the maximum stacking number. So basically the maximum stacking number of switches is again as I talked about before you can have these switches with the uplink ports they can be connected to each other in order to create you know that that large LAN again let's say you have a building with multiple floors that type of thing basically what this says is it says how many switches can you stack how many switches can you connect together and that maxes out at nine so again important thing if you need to connect ten switches together don't buy this switch Really basic math here. Uh, then they have the stack bandwidth. This is important. So the stack bandwidth for the entire stack is going to be 160 gigabits per second at once. Again, this is something that, that a lot of people don't, don't think about when they're, they're looking to buy a switch, is when you have the switch, right, you have these gigabit, uh, these gigabit ports. Just because you have gigabit ports doesn't mean the switch can handle every single port being fully utilized at one gigabit per second at a time, right? So this is a 24 port switch. Oh, if you have a nine of these things connected together, that's over 200 ports. So if all 200 ports were trying to communicate at full speed, the important thing to understand here is that the entire stack will max out at 160 gigabits per second. Um, does this matter for you? Probably not. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of data. But this might be important, again, in an environment where you're replicating data around. So let's say in your environment, you have an infrastructure where people are doing uh, online backups. So people are backing up from wherever they are up onto your infrastructure. And then once it comes onto your infrastructure, then that data gets replicated around You make multiple copies in case there's any failure, all of that kind of stuff, right? If your infrastructure is just simply dealing with just moving massive amounts of data around all the time. Large files, we're not talking about small little database records or something like that. So you're moving large files around a lot, then you, then you might run into an issue where there's 160 gigabits per second for the entire stack matters. Again, most, li most likely not. Uh, we have the forwarding performance. Um, yeah, if this matters to you, you're doing better than me. Uh, basically, what this means is this can forward 68.45 million packets per second. Again, remember when we talk about uh, when we're sending data on a network, we have frames and we have packets so that that data right that entire file gets chopped down into frames and packets so basically what this is saying is this particular switch can can transfer 68.45 million packets per second and again that 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 might be an issue for you I've never had to deal with anything that quite that sophisticated. Uh, then we have the switch switching capacity. So this is the capacity of the single switch itself, right? Uh, and so this maxes out at 88 gigabits per second. Can't do any more than 88 gigabits per second, which should be fine. Uh, we then have RAM, uh, again, especially when we're dealing with uh, enterprise class network equipment. Do you realize this has hardware resources, just like any other thing would have hardware resources? So for this particular switch, it has four gigs of RAM. 
probably fine, more than enough, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, then you have flash memory. So it has two gigs of flash memory. The flash memory is for storing configurations. Uh, two gigs should be fine. <laughs> Can't imagine this is going to be a problem for you. But in the old days, uh, the, uh, the the flash memory size could be a problem if you're trying to put in very complicated configurations into your switch. Uh, you might run into problems with it, that the size of, of how basically how many configurations you could store. Uh, this won't be a problem here. Uh, then you have some interesting things. And again, depending on your particular environment and, and what you're creating, this might matter. Uh, so for this particular switch, it actually has a number of wireless access points per switch slash stack. Uh, again, so if you're creating an infrastructure for a college campus, uh, maybe a hospital, that type of thing, you're going to be putting up a hell of a lot of wireless access points. Just do realize this networking equipment actually has a maximum. Uh, so for the stack, so this is for the entire stack, so for all nine switches connected together, they can only support 50 wireless access points for some reason. Uh, why? I don't really know. That's, it seems like a it seems like a weird uh, weird limit, uh, but it's a limit it has. Uh, again, number of wireless clients per switch stack. So all the different wireless clients that are connected to this entire uh, stack. Again, up to nine switches connected together. You can only have a thousand uh, wireless clients at one time uh, before you start having problems. Again, this is this is the type of thing that you need to be researching. And that's where I talk about when you're going to be building out your environment. Again, 50 access points and a thousand a thousand wireless users, at, and, and this is at one time. At one time, that, that's more than probably matters, like for most people. But again, in your environment. This might be an issue. Uh, let's say, again, let's say you're thinking about uh, building out a wireless infrastructure for, um, let's say, an, an airport, an airport. But not only are you building out wireless infrastructure for, you know, guests to be able to get on the internet and that type of thing, but what if you have an internet of things environment uh, where all the thermostats uh, are going to be wirelessly connected, all of the uh, the, the terminals are going to, you know, like little key card terminals are going to be wirelessly connected, right? Imagine if you went to an airport and then just think of everything in that airport be having a Wi-Fi connection, right? At that point, Literally, you may have over a thousand uh, wireless devices all trying to communicate at the network at the same time, and this this might be a weird failure for you. And so it's very it's very important again, especially at that enterprise level that you go through and you look at all these different specifications to make sure that you're purchasing what you need. Uh, that's where again, if you're buying stuff in the enterprise world, FTC compliance they haven't paid me anything. CDW can be very useful. So CDW. Uh, you know Newegg, right? If you go to Newegg.com, you just go to Newegg and you buy whatever you're doing. Uh, CDW is basically kind of like the Newegg for the enterprise world. Uh, when you purchase things from CDW, though, most of the time you actually need to have a uh, an agent. They'll, they'll give you a sales agent. You'll actually talk with a sales agent and they will make sure uh, that what you're purchasing is, is what you're supposed to purchase. Um, and so that can be a valuable thing. Again, like some people will get, you just try to purchase Cisco equipment off of, you know, uh, eBay or Amazon or something like that. And when you do that, that's fine if you get what you need. Sometimes, again, we start looking at all these different requirements. The problem that you can run into is the, the switch that you purchase does exactly what what they said it would do, but what you need it to do is something different, right? Um, anyways, we come down here again. We can take a look at the as the switch as we were looking before in the rest of the class. Again, we've got the the, the, the 24 ports on it. Uh, we've got the uplink ports over on the side. If you turn the switch around, uh, there's some interesting things you can see here. Uh, basically, here this is where we have the uh, the console port and the management port. Uh, so in the Cisco world, uh, they have this little console wire that you can run from your computer to your Cisco switch or to your, your your Cisco piece of networking equipment and basically it's a way that you can it's called console into the equipment to make configurations uh, this can be a useful security mechanism right if, if you do not have a management console that's that's IP addressable um, then it's harder for people to try to hack that networking equipment right so some people will simply um, only allow the, uh, the networking equipment to be consoled into uh, but they can also have a management port so this has a management port on it 
this can actually then be connected to the network and it's accessible through an IP address. Just one of those things to consider on the back and then you see your, uh, your, your power supplies and, and that type of thing, your fans. Uh, if we scroll down, we can take a look at some more of this. This gets into some more detailed specifications here. Um, Let's see, it talks about uh, multi, again, things like CPU, so multi-core CPU, uh, the maximum number of VLAN IDs. Uh, so we talked about the VLANs before. Again, remember in the enterprise world, you may have a lot of VLANs. You're gonna have up to 4,000 VLANs on this type of thing. Uh, let's see here, it talks about, yeah, the CPU, it talks about the RAM, it talks about the flash storage. Again, the, the, the wireless access points, those are, those are some of the things to be taking a look at. Uh, and then if we keep scrolling down, one of the interesting things here is it talks about the compliance standards. So this is basically things like the routing protocols, that type of deal. Uh, so we have something called the spanning tree protocol. Uh, that's one of the routing protocols that exists. Uh, we have the, the VLAN configurations here. We have a whole bunch of different specifications, again, that might actually make sense in your particular environment. Uh, most people are going to probably ignore that. Uh, then, you know, it gives operating temperatures uh, that might be an important thing to take a look at. Uh, again, this can be important in your environment where let's say this again, let's say it's for like surveillance cameras or something like that. And it's going into an industrial environment. So like normally you're used to putting networking equipment into your server room or into your data center where it's 65 degrees and it's completely clean air. So most of the time you don't look at things like operating temperatures. Uh, but it is important to be thinking about like what if what if this is the switch that's going to connect all of your, your equipment in a warehouse? Does that warehouse get too hot for the networking equipment and the networking equipment will shut down. Uh, basically, is the networking equipment built for the environment that you're dealing with? Again, things like uh, operating relative humidity, you know, 95% to 96%. Uh, that might be an important thing. Uh, I ran into this in the real world, not with uh, networking equipment, but I had a client who bought a digital surveillance system uh, from me. They bought lots of cameras, about 16 cameras, and it was in a barn. It was in a barn. <laughs> This is a real story too, right? So they buy the, they buy this beautiful digital surveillance system. I go in there, I wire up the barn, but there's an office space, right, in the office. And so that is where the digital surveillance system is supposed to be. And so before they buy the digital surveillance system, I tell them, look, this is a barn. Like this dust, this dirt, this heat will destroy your digital surveillance system. So is this room going to be air conditioned? And they said, yes, Eli, yes, Eli. We are having an air conditioner installed and the door will always be closed. So, okay. <laughs> right? I did, I did my responsibility. I tell them the problem and they tell me, right? So anyways, I install this you know, $20,000 system or whatever the hell it was, slap it in there. Three months later, it fails. Three months later, it fails. They call me back for warranty work. <laughs> I go there and the door is wide open. There is no air conditioning and the digital surveillance system, it basically looks like the inside of a vacuum cleaner. Uh, that was a less than amusing discussion I had with them. Uh, but again, this is, this is the type of thing to be thinking about with your environment. Again, especially with a lot of my viewers, right? If you're in India, if you're in Pakistan, if you're in some places in Africa, right? You might be in an environment that is not, you know, clean that it's not cold it doesn't it doesn't matter from a cleanliness standard it, but it might actually matter from the equipment standard with your equipment in that particular environment will it fail again uh, you know networking equipment is just like anything else if the temperature gets above a certain level it will automatically shut off in order to try to protect itself from being damaged so if your equipment is in an environment that keeps getting really hot your network equipment keeps shutting off that can be a big problem for you uh i think that was interesting uh, a number of years ago i went to uh interop interop is a conference an it conference and when huawei was uh, was getting bigger one of the interesting things is i said it said it sat in with a panel for Huawei and they were talking about all the networking equipment that they were designing for third world countries. And again, it's, it's important to be thinking about this for your environment. And so with Huawei's equipment, all the Huawei equipment had built in, I think it was, I think they had built in battery backup. And not only that, it was a hundred percent sealed. So with a lot of Cisco equipment that you buy, most Cisco equipment, uh, they cool through airflow, right? You have fans, 
on the uh, the Cisco equipment that pulls air through the equipment and back out again. Again, perfectly flat, fine in a clean environment. In a dusty, dirty environment, that turns your switch into a vacuum cleaner. Uh, what Huawei did is they had completely 100% sealed networking equipment that was designed for hot environments. Essentially, the outside of the networking equipment was a big... Um, a heat sink essentially uh, and so it was built or, for those types of places and so again that's one of the things you have to be thinking about when you purchase that your your networking equipment is what environment is it going to go into and so and so what do you need to be thinking about you know purchasing that that type of equipment and so again with this kind of stuff they'll tell you the specifications you know heat cool uh, the whole nine yards um, and so basically that's uh, that's the specifications of this particular switch and it gets just kind of gives you an idea of what to be thinking about when you purchase a switch again or or assessing what's already in your environment so there you go. There's a little bit more of an overview of network switches, right? These these are literally the backbone of your network. You you cannot be an IT professional that says, you know, switches. You know, I saw switches, but I de I decided I was going to build my network without switches. You just can't do that. If you want a TCP IP version for uh, Ethernet network, you're gonna have to have switches. And so it is very important that you understand the functionality of these switches so that you can decide what is best. Uh, the important thing to remember here is this is not about getting a CCNA, right? So a lot of people, when they start looking at networking, they start looking at switches and all that, they're like, oh, I have to go out and get a CCNA to understand this. Do you realize a CCNA is a Cisco certified network administrator? That is about Cisco networking equipment. Uh, the equipment that you're actually going to purchase may be from a different vendor. Again, a lot of people right now really like Ubiquity. Ubiquity is a fraction of the cost of Cisco equipment. Uh, their web interface is supposed to be absolutely be amazing. And so a lot of folks are buying Ubiquity equipment at this point. Uh, or they're going out and you can buy Netgear equipment. Or again, like Buffalo, right? If you have a you know, you don't, you don't think about Buffalo and networking equipment, but you know, if you're creating just a little uh, surveillance camera system, you know, uh, IP surveillance camera system, you might just go out there and buy a, a Buffalo uh, switch. That might be useful for you. So do realize you don't have to go out there to get the CCNA to understand this stuff, uh, but you do just have to understand some of the basics here. Uh, again, when you're taking a look at the switch, you've got the front ports on the switch. Uh, they will be different speeds and they'll have different functions, right? 10, uh, 10 megabits per second, 10, 100 or 10, 100 gig. Uh, so basically that would be a gigabit per second speed. Uh, the important thing to realize here is again, some of your old legacy equipment that might be a slower speed than gigabit per second. Uh, so something to consider. Uh, again, the power over Ethernet, that's going to be in a big one in the modern world, especially with the Internet of Things. Uh, so if you're powering voice over IP uh, uh, telephones, if you're powering surveillance cameras, that type of deal, actually being able to power them from the ports on your switch can be incredibly useful. But there are different levels of PoE, so you just have to make sure that your switch actually abides by whatever level you need for your particular devices. Also, when you're taking a look at the ports on your switch make sure make sure they line up with what you want again a lot of times you'll see a you'll see a 24 port poe switch and you think oh that's 24 ports of poe and it's like no it's four ports of poe it's 24 ports total and it might only be four ports that actually have power over an ethernet again to be clear that that might that might work fine for you but it's just important to understand that make sure you know what you're buying uh, then we have the uplink ports again the uplink ports uh, will either be cat 6 or it'll be that sfp uh, spf SFP. Anyways, uh, the, the fiber optic cable, uh, the important thing there, again, fiber optic cable is fine. Uh, fiber optic cable is useful for the longer runs, right? If you're going to be run, doing runs between floors and buildings or be, between different buildings, you can get a lot more length out of a fiber optic cable. You just have to realize you're dealing with fiber optic cable now. And so, you know, there, there might be something that you have to deal with with that. Uh, beyond that, one of the things you have to look at is, again, how many switches that you can actually stack together. Uh, what is a Allowed. Uh, when I showed you the, the, that last switch, right, you could have nine switches get stacked together. So you can't have 10. So again, this is really simple math here. If, if you have 10 floors in a building, each floor needs a switch. Therefore, you're going to, you, you need to stack 10 switches. That means don't buy the switch I just showed you because you can only stack nine, right? 
it's not that complicated. But uh, then beyond that, again, there's the, the overall stack speed. So as I showed you, you could have nine switches stacked together and the maximum stack speed, basically the data gain transfer over the entire stack maxes out at 160 gigabits per second. Now to be clear, that is, that's a metric crap ton of data. That's more data than most people would ever need to care about. But again, to be clear, in your environment, again, if you're moving a lot of data back and forth, right? Again, if you're doing, if you're replicating large, you know, you, large files or that type of thing, you might run into problems. The other thing to be thinking about, again, this is Cisco equipment. So when you take a look at somebody else's equipment, maybe Netgear, maybe Ubiquiti, somebody like that, they'll tell you, they, they might tell you what the total stack speed is, and that might be a hell of a lot less. Past that, uh, we talked about the loop detection. Again, that's very important that your, your switch can actually detect loops, because if it doesn't, <laughs> It's a good way to crash your entire network. And then you have routing protocols and that type of thing in there. Uh, we talked about VLANs. Again, VLANs is a way to take one physical switch and essentially chop it up into multiple logical switches. It's important to understand here, this is not virtualization like AWS or Azure or virtual private servers or, open or anything like that. This is basically where you take one physical switch and you just chop it into multiple logical switches that can either be done by actually setting setting the ports to being a particular VLAN or by using something called VLAN tagging. Again, if you're going to create VLANs, go do a little bit more research on that to, to take a look at it. Um, and then finally, do remember with purchasing a switch, whether you purchase a managed or an unmanaged switch, a managed switch is not necessarily better than an unmanaged switch. Basically, it just means that you can go in and do configurations. If you just need a switch to connect some voice over IP phones together, or maybe create a small database cluster or something like that, an, an unmanaged switch might be fine for you. On the other hand, if you actually need to go in, do a lot of configurations, that type of thing you can go and get a managed switch when you do buy a managed switch again remember how you how you manage that switch is going to be up to the vendor if you buy some kind of cisco equipment right that might be using the command line so just like with linux you will need to know the command line in order to manage that switch if you know the command line fine if you don't don't buy the switch uh, it might be a, a web console. Again, you, you use a web browser, you go to an IP address, you pull up the, uh, the management console, and you're able to configure it that way. It might be some kind of cloud management service. Again, it might be an app on your smartphone. There are a lot of ways to, uh, to manage uh, switches in the modern world. And the important thing here is not that one is good or one is bad. Just make sure you know what the hell you're buying, right? Uh, again, this can be a big problem too, especially in like small business environments. Uh, so again, an environment, let's say 20, a 24 port switch. Uh, one of the things is you might go out and you might buy a switch that seems really good today, right? Oh, look, this has an iOS management console. I want to be able to manage this, this switch from my iOS device, right? And today that's great. But one of the things you're going to have to think about is if they stop supporting that app in two or three years, what happens with your switch past that? If you have a web interface for your switch, uh, then that'll keep working forever. If you have a command line interface for your switch, that'll keep working forever. Again, if you have an app for your switch, that could go away tomorrow. And especially one of these, these cloud providers. So a lot of people now they're trying to put the services like the interface is actually up in the cloud, which can be very useful. But the problem you run with run in there is again, if they go out of business, then then all of your networking equipment can essentially become worthless. Or with uh, with much of the equipment where they use some some kind of cloud interface, you have to pay a monthly fee, right? So if you purchase normal Cisco equipment or normal ubiquity equipment or whatever else, you buy it and it's done. It might be thirty two hundred dollars, but it's done. If you buy some of this other networking equipment they have some kind of cloud management interface, that might be an extra 10 bucks per month per network device or more. For some reason, if the company can't pay it or doesn't pay that fee, all of a sudden you're no longer able to configure any of your networking equipment. <laughs> that can be a problem. Again, not a good, not a bad. It's just one of those things how it is. Uh, so anyways, that's a basic overview of uh, network switches for you. Uh, as always, I enjoy teaching this class. Look forward to seeing the next one.